Chapter 15, Breaking Down the Barriers. If you belong to a large family, you learn from a very early age to be com extremely competitive. Belonging to our family was no exception. There was always a race to see who could finish first to almost anything, getting dressed, playing a game, answering a quiz or getting somewhere the quickest. Even mealtimes turned out to be a competition. This called for subtlety because Mommy was very strict about our table manners, but sometimes our manners went out the window because of Junior's irritating eating habits. He had a small appetite and never finished all of his food. The rest of us would be like crazed piranhas closing in, ready to gobble, gobble up any scraps left on the plate. And before he could say, I don't want any more, his leftovers would be in one of our mouths and down the gullet. The winner of the champion was the champion of that sitting and I won that challenge many times. Being so competitive made me a high achiever at school, both academically and as an athlete. Exam was taken, exams were taken after crammed revision at the end of the school year, and the results were always eagerly awaited at home. Everyone would be anxious to compare marks and passes. To get the most passes was great, but to come top of the form was the ultimate prize. The subjects I came top in were French, history, geography, maths and music, but I was lousy at art. I was so bad that my art teacher, a real tyrant we named Bulldog Burton, asked me to leave the class because my grades were so awful. Z minus. She wrote in my report that my enthusiasm would be better spent elsewhere. Some of that enthusiasm was spent competing in the sports arena. Although I didn't use much of it in the swimming pool, this was because the teacher told me I didn't have to bother. She condescendingly informed me at my first swimming lesson that people of my race had an extra bone in their feet which made them unable to swim and if I tried I would sink immediately. So I was left on my own to splash and paddle around in the shallow end while the other girls were coached and encouraged to swim length after length from the deep end. But I needed no encouragement when it came to netball, hockey, rounders and my greatest love, athletics. I adored all of these sports and because of my great competitiveness, I was usually the captain and champion of most of the team, of most of the teams. My enthusiasm drove my fellow teammates on. We played to win, and if we didn't, I would make sure the net we won the next time. Motivating others was easy for me because at home it was just a way of life. This competitiveness was a major plus on school sports day. The big event was usually held on a hot summer's day in June. The smell of freshly cut grass lingered in the air as we marched out onto the carpet-like field. The perfectly straight, brilliant white painted lines on the green grass gave, me a, feel gave a feeling of formality. The noise of chattering, jittering schoolgirls grew louder and louder as the school emptied out onto the playing field. Dozens of girls in white Airtex polo shirts and baggy navy blue knickers covered the horizon, each wearing a coloured sash representing her schoolhouse. I wore my yellow one proudly. I belonged to the house of Elizabeth Fry. The other houses were named after famous women too. Florence Nightingale, represented by a red flame red, royal blue for Charlotte Bronte and emerald green for Edith Cavill. These women's names were on four boards in the Great Hall. Under them, listed by year, were the results of the winning houses and the names of the champions. Each morning as I filed into the hall for assembly, I would pass the boards and hope that one day my name would be up there. On my first sports day, I knew the opportunity had come for me to make that happen. This was my chance to show what I could do. We sat cross-legged on the grass and waited for our names to be called out for our races. I heard my name called and walked to the starting line for 100 metres. As I crouched on my marks, I could feel my heart thumping against my knee. I felt slightly dizzy and nauseous as I looked up the lane. Then I heard the loud bang of the starting pistol and saw the other runners pelting off, leaving me frozen on the line. I managed to jerk my legs into overdrive and sped off too, clawing my way up the track. Wind assisted by my voluminous knickers, frantically re reeling in runner after runner until I was out in front, pushing my chest towards the tape, breaking it with all my might. That was the first of my many victories at school. I felt so proud when I went up to receive my medal. The achievement meant so much to me. I later went on to represent the school in the county school championships. Our school usually won and it was customary for the captain to take the cup home just for the weekend. 
When I became captain, I looked forward to that privilege. It wasn't to be. We did win, and I did go up to receive the car. But as I was about to go home with it, as my predecessors had done many times before, the games teacher took it away from me. Smiling falsely, she did so, saying, I'll look after that. I handed the cup over in a state of shock, stripped of my privilege. I realised that she thought I was good enough to win races for them, but not good enough to take the cup home to show my family. I was refused that honour. I walked home with my tears running down my cheeks, trying to think how I was going to explain my hurt and disappointment to my family. And there's a lovely illustration there. They would help cushion the blow, not just Marmy, but my brothers and sisters too. We all motiva motivated each other. And even though we fought like cats and dogs, no one from the outside world would come between us. My family was a source of strength, not just physical strength, but spiritual strength. Mommy served up heaps of it to us each day. And to top it all, she also made sure that we went to church, just as we had done in Trinidad. One Sunday morning, we'd all gone to a grey stone church in Penge to give thanks for what we had. Inside, the light from the stained glass window shone on the handful of people taking part in the mild, controlled, unemotional service not at all like the ones I was used to. Still, I said my prayers, asked for forgiveness and sang out as loudly as I could, trying to rejoice in the only one I, way I knew how. At the end of the service, we filed out, smiling and fulfilled. But as we stood at the top of the church worn stone steps, I noticed that the other parishioners looked tense and uncomfortable, not at all like people who'd just come out from worshipping and whose souls had been rejuvenated. Well, I wondered why they looked so happy, unhappy and angry. As we made our way down the steps and got closer to a group of them, I overheard words that I didn't expect to hear from so-called Christians. Instead of welcoming, welcoming us into their flock, they were saying, I see they're letting in that kind now. Is no place sacred? And then it dawned on me. They, we were the only West Indians in the congregation, invading their little cosy world. I felt so betrayed. This was one set of people in England I expected to greet us with open arms, but they proved to be totally hypocritical, going against everything they'd just vowed to uphold, to love, care for, and respect their follow, fellow man and treat others as they, would, as they would expect to be treated. We never returned to that church again, but instead went to a place of worship built by West Indians. That was the place where we were welcomed, where we worshipped and rejoiced, knowing in our hearts that we were wanted there. Churches like this started to spring up all over the country and whatever your needs, you could rely on them to help and support you, not only spiritually, but in some cases financially as well. West Indian churches were always full to the brim with people rejoicing out loud. I sang out, not only in church, but at school too, where I took part in many competitions as a member of the school choir. The first time I performed a solo act was in the school Christmas concert. And up until then, I'd only performed at the concert with the choir, but now I was going it alone. I took a while to decide what to do, act, sing or dance. I couldn't decide, so I did all three. I chose a song, She'll Be Coming Round the Mountain When She Comes, and dressed up as a hillbilly, complete with checked shirt, jeans, boots, hat and a spotted necktie. I took the idea from one of the films I'd seen back in Trinidad. I waited anxiously in the wings as the other performers carried out their routines and then it was my turn. I was announced. The piano teacher played a loud intro and I was away. Something took over my body and I became a rooting, tooting hillbilly, prancing energetically up and down the stage as if it was I were in the Rockies. Thunderous applause broke my trance as I came to the end, everyone screaming for more. The headmistress, Mrs Bowles, a stout woman of vision came on stage, shook my hand and congratulated me. She then asked the girls if they wanted to hear me again and they all shouted, yes, more, more. I looked down at the sea of faces below me. They were staring back with a look in their eyes that I'd never seen before. It was a look of admiration and respect. It seemed that suddenly <coughs> they saw me as a person, not a colour. I had no idea why it had taken a song and a dance routine to change their perception of me. All I knew was that I looked at them and I could tell they saw me differently. 
And then I realised I'd given the song everything and I'd overwhelmed them with my energy until their prejudices were swept away. And at that moment, I knew that in order to make a success of my life, to be a doctor, a lawyer or a bank manager, I'd have to work twice as hard as anyone else and be twice as good. I had to develop the ability to make people see me as a person, someone with feelings, pride, dignity and intellect. Daddy had opened our minds to the world with knowledge. Mommy had instilled strength, determination, conviction and confidence, us in, confidence in us. Now it was up to me to merge them together and absorb them into my song. These were to be the ground rules on which my new life was to be built. I had to make something out of it without losing my true identity. It was a massive task, but not an impossible one. My thoughts were interrupted by the heavy notes of the piano playing the intro once again. This time I danced with joy for myself, reveling in my new discovery. After the concert in the playground, Sandra pushed her way through the throng of admiring girls and hugged me. She too had felt the barrier crumble. We'd conquered them. A major leap had, taken, had been taken that day. We were going to come up against more barriers in the future, but there would always be ways to break them down. And with our competitiveness, we could do it. I was convinced of that when someone for the crowd shouted, what are you doing at next year's concert? Sandra and I turned to each other and smiled, our eyes bright as moonbeams. And then we walked off home, hand in hand, eager to tell our news to Marmy and the rest of the family.